Jesse van Winkel, and I'm going to give you a talk about uh, SRE, Site Reliability Engineering at Google. I am a site reliability engineer, have been so for six and a half years. Um, and before that, I've been teaching Unix and C++ uh, uh, for, for more than 20 years. Um, <clears throat> I'm based in Zurich, uh, which is our uh, engineering headquarters in Europe, EMEA. So who of you has heard about SRE? And I, yeah, I want to say, see some hands. OK, cool. That's good. Um, and what is the difference between SRE and this DevOps thing that you hear uh, so much about? Um, well, that is what I'm going to try and answer in this session. And I will show you how we actually get the dev side and the ops side aligned instead of having them uh, fight together. They, they seem to have opposing goals, but actually within Google, we have made sure that these people do not have opposing goals, but they actually want to, do, want to go the same way. They have the same goals. So what is site reliability engineering? Um, well, it's very simple. We want to keep the site up, always. Uh, and what is the site? Uh, well, the site is google.com. Uh, and why does it have to stay up? Well, be honest. Whenever you have a problem with your internet and you fiddle with the wires, what is the first thing you try to see that the internet is back up again? Right? You go to www.google.com. So we have to make sure that the site is always up, otherwise you can't test your internet connection. OK, good. Um, if the site is unavailable, it is the SRE's job to make sure that we get it back up. It's our problem, no matter what the problem is. So why do we want reliability? Um, well, basically, it is the only feature that counts. Um, you know what this is? This is a phone. Yeah? This phone has a lot of features. Now, what would I be happier with? A phone that has even more features, but is only available half the time because it breaks all the time? Or would I rather have the phone as it is now? Um, or, to put it in another way, would you rather have Gmail 2016 or, new product, Gmail 500. Yes. <clears throat> it's, it's all about keeping the thing up. Reliability is key. Without reliability, you can add as many features as you want. If the site is down regularly, then people will go away, and people won't use your product anymore, no matter how many features you have, no matter how cool the features are. So we want to keep the site up as much as possible. Um, and there is another thing. <clears throat> Reliability is something that you get used to. Um, if I look at Switzerland, where I live, near Zurich, <clears throat> I can't really remember that I had a power outage in the past six years I lived there. No power outage. I don't even think about electricity being there or not. I actually only notice that electricity may not be fully reliable the moment it goes away. Right? So reliability is the one reliability is the thing that you easily take for granted, just as I take for granted that electricity is always there from the power uh, outlet. Now, <clears throat> reliability is the absence of errors. Um, it is the fact that we don't have any failures. The problem is that these systems that we have, not just at Google, but in many places, they start failing not when one small thing goes bad, they start failing when many small things work together and go bad, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen um, 
a, a TV series on National Geographic called uh, Seconds from Disaster or Air Crash Investigations or whatever, it is never the case that it is one thing that goes bad before the entire thing collapses. It is always many things that add up to one thing that finally makes the system fail. So that means that the moment the users start noticing that something is bad, that the Google is no longer up, it is not just one small thing that is bad. It is behind the scenes a lot of bad things that work well, not work together, but a lot of coincidence, coincidences that make the thing not work. So therefore, we need to work at reliability all the time. It is so much easier to keep a system that is reliable from the start, to keep it reliable, than to actually get something that is very bad in a very bad state and get that reliable. It's easier to keep up. It's easier to maintain a well-maintained car than to take a car that has a bad engine, that has leaky tires, that has lots of bad stuff, and then try and fix it. Yep. So we want to work at uh, reliability all the time. Now, reliability means that we want fewer changes, right? When, when, when do we get in reliable situation, unreliable situations? It's the moment that people start fiddling with the system. Agreed? The moment we roll out new software. So the developers, on one hand, they love rolling out new features because that's what they do. They really, really want to work on this new thing and they have this new shiny idea about what we could do and, and the users will be delighted and everyone is happy. The ops part of the world says, you know what we should do? We should have a code freeze for six months. Then we will have a six month reliable system. Nothing changes, everything is fine. So these seem to be, <coughs> sorry, these uh, goals, they seem to be in conflict. The developers want to roll out features fast and quick and often, and they want to see the whole world using them. We're talking about billions of users, awesome. On the other hand, ops want stability. It is no fun getting paged in the middle of the night. Um, been there, done that. So, no, I, we, we, we don't want that. And, and then there is this other thing. The developers, they use a slightly different language from people in ops. They will say, no, 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 no. This is not a launch. This is just a flag flip. You know what a flag flip is? It is you have this flag on the command line that enables or disables a new feature that you have guarded with this flag. So just a flag, flag, uh, flip, flag flip means that you're actually, for the first time, enabling a new feature in production. But the devs, they will say, it's just a flag flip. Um, yeah, right. Or they will say, well, it's, it's, it's only a UI change. Nothing in the logic has changed. Uh-huh, uh, or this is, this is only a 20% experiment that some 20% are included. It's, it's nothing, it's not a launch. It's not a real rollout. It's, it only adds two small features. Yeah, um, so <clears throat> they, the devs, have their own language that makes things not look like launches and the ops, they start to become allergic to these terms, right? Um, and then there is another uh, problem. Um, there is an enormous uh, information asymmetry. Ops doesn't know the code base. They only keep the stuff running, right? Um, okay. The team that knows the least about the code, they have to keep it running. So there is this, this um, problem. Um, it seems to be there is a conflict, um, but there isn't. 
there is no conflict or there doesn't have to be a conflict. If there was a conflict there, then you would not be able to go to www.google.com now or to maps or I couldn't be able to sh I wouldn't be able to show my slides now that come from Google Docs. As a re site reliability engineering, um, we do not attempt to make an estimate at what the risk is for a new launch. We don't avoid all outages. Um, actually, we embrace risk. Risk is great. Um, we don't set the release policy. But how do we do that? How do we keep Google running if we do not attempt to assess risk, if we do not avoid outages, um, if we actually embrace risk, and if we don't set release policies? How can we keep things running? Um, we have some magic sauce here. It is called error budgets. But before I can talk about error budgets, I have to talk about SLAs. Um, note, this is how we do our releases. Um, and we will see how this actually accelerates and make things, makes things more reliable. So what is an SLA? Um, I think everyone here knows what an SLA is. Can I see a show of hands? Uh, how about the other side? Who doesn't know what an SLA is? Ta-da, there you go. So it's an agreement between a provider uh, and a consumer. There can be many different kinds of SLAs. Um, in the end, there uh, will be criteria. There will be um, uh, service level indicators, as we call them. So the amount of uptime, the latency has to be within certain bounds, etc. We have these indicators, and then you have these criteria, and these criteria determine whether or not you meet your objectives. And in the end, if your SLA is not met, uh, probably money will exchange hands or something like that. So we want to stay within our SLA, but um, SLAs do have ramifications. Um, here is something that has a 100% SLA, or I hope it has a 100% SLA, or at least it has 100% reliability. This um, is a pacemaker, a hard pacemaker, and you really want this thing to keep on running, right? I can also show something that does not have a 100% SLA. Computers. Computers break all the time. Um, let me ask a question. I have a phone. You, have, you probably have a smartphone. How often, how often does it happen that you take out your phone and you start the app that you want and it crashes immediately? Is this better than 1 in 10? So does it happen 1 in 10 times that it crashes? It's better than that? It's better than that. Is it better than one in a hundred times? Uh, it depends, but I know many apps that, that, don't, that don't run 90, 999 times out of a thousand. They, they will, so that means that this phone or the software on it has about two nines of reliability, right? So how much reliability do you really want? Um, People talk about five nines. People talk about four nines. Do people really know what it means? Well, two nines means 99% of 100. It's OK, or we're in within latency. Or I have a table here. Five nines of uptime means at most five minutes of downtime a year. Or if you do this in quarters, just over a minute and, and 15 seconds. Um, it means that you have less than a second of downtime a day on average. Now think about this. I have my phone. We said this has two nines of reliability. I'm connecting to a service in the cloud. Do you think it's really necessary for that service in the cloud to have five nines of reliability if the device I'm using has only two. Do you really think that the user 
is going to notice if the service that is backing this thing has only two and a half nines of reliability or three nines of reliability. If it has only three nines of reliability, it means that nine out of the 10 times that the thing crashes, it is the phone's fault. And the 10th time it crashes, they will point at the phone and not at the service that is backing the phone, right? And there is a cost involved with getting more nines. Not only does it require more people, it requires more software, it requires more intricate setups. Um, so it's very expensive. Don't ever offer more nines than you, what you really need. Um, so this is SLA. Let's go back to error budgets. The error budget is one minus the SLA. If you say that you have three nines of uptime, it means that it is okay to have 0.1% of downtime. Because that's your contract. And you know what? You better use that contract. You better use that 0.1% that you have. Because what can we do? We can spend, we can spend this error budget for being down because we did an aggressive rollout. And if we then roll it back, if things go bad, and we're still within our SLA, and we haven't used up all our error budget, we're still within SLA, and no one's going to complain. Right? So therefore, it is important that you have an SLA that is not too strict. Don't offer more nines than you really need, because it means that you are putting, you give yourself fewer opportunities to being aggressive in rollouts and things like that. So what do we spend our budget on? Well, we already said that change is the number one cause of failures, of outages. Um, and the biggest source of, outage, of, of change is, of course, a launch or a rollout of a new version of your product. Um, so what we do, we spend our error budgets uh, on launches which is awesome, or you can spend your error budget on uh, crappy software that uh, goes down all the time. What would you rather spend your error budget on, right? On service instability or on being aggressive on rolling things out? So what is the rule? The rule is, if the service is still within SLA, and you determine some window, it could be one month, could be a quarter, uh, whatever you want. If the service is still within SLA, you do your launch, whatever you want. But the moment you're getting outside of your SLA, we freeze launches until we are within SLA again. Now, this creates a magnificent feedback loop because it means that if the devs create crappy software, they get one launch a quarter, and that's it, right? However, if they write really good software, and they write the software with reliability in mind from the beginning, then they can launch as often as they want because they're still within SLA, right? So we got a, we got a self regulating system here. Now, the, <coughs> um, the SREs, the site reliability engineers, they don't know what causes failure. The, the devs, they, they, they develop a way, and the SREs have no clue what, is, uh, what was the cause of the, what, what's the reason for the change and what the exact change was. Of course, they get a change log and they will be informed, but they don't know exact the lines of code, etc. which means that if something goes bad, it's up, it's up to the devs to fix it. Yes, we will mitigate, as we will mitigate, and we will roll back if needed, but then the devs will have to go and fix the software. Um, 
Of course, you can change your SLA. If it turns out that you're always out of SLA, you can say, oh, is it really needed that we have three nines? Maybe we can go back to two and a half nines or two nines. I mean, the crappy phone is not, oh. Um, well, if you, if you slip the SLA a bit, it means that your customers are getting less service. On the other hand, if you tighten the SLA more, it means that you have less aggress aggressive rollouts. So it's all about innovation versus stability. And the great thing about having error budgets is it removes, it removes the potential source of conflict between developers and SRE. Because suddenly, because of these error budgets, it's both in the SRE's interest and in the developer's interest to have the st most stable software there is and to have quick and fast rollouts. And we see that the dev teams, they self-police because um, they are not monolithic. The dev teams depend on other software in the entire ecosystem. And they have an SLA with the underlying software as well. So it's, they're policing each other, and it just works. So that is the error budget thing. That's one way to make sure that we get uh, aligned in the right way. There is another part to this within SRE, and that is about staffing and the type of work that we do and how we handle overload. The problem is that you can throw as many people as you want on a badly functioning system and keep it running, but people are going to run away from that. They will not want to work there. They get bored. Uh, they, well, not just bored. Uh, they get, they want to go away. They will leave you. Uh, it means that attrition is going up. You'll have a harder job hiring. It's, it's a bad uh, system to be in. It isn't a fun job. And we don't ask SREs to do that kind of thing. Uh, Within SRE, we say, don't throw human blood at the machine. We just want to keep things running. Um, but, it, you know, it, it might be very tempting. Uh, you know what it's like when you have a house and there is this tiny little sliver of paint uh, in the windowsill that is, that is coming off? And you say, oh, you know what, it's only a tiny sliver of paint that's coming off. Uh, I'll see in half a year, and oh, there is a tiny sliver of paint coming off there as well, and oh, uh, I know this tap doesn't work anymore, but I will, I will look at that later. And, and before you know it, everything breaks down. Um, but it's very tempting. Um, the developers, they see whatever is there, and that's all they see. They don't see what the work that the SREs have to put in it to keep it stable and keep it running. So they don't see all that work, so they might not care. They can't see the operations work, therefore it doesn't exist. They are working, uh, they're working on production stuff that SRE does or that they have to do themselves um, is slowing the feature development. Um, so here we have another problem around incentives. We have six fixes around this. Uh, and Google does all of these, and I will go through these uh, six. First of all, we have a common staffing pool. And what I mean by that is uh, we hire software engineers both for development and for SREs. If a new team needs to be started, let's say we're starting a great new product, call it whatever, let's say Gmail, way back when, and people start thinking, okay, um, we, need we need 20 people. Well, that means that you get 20 headcount, 20 people. Some of these are going to be SRE. Some of these are going to be developers. And at some point, you're going to choose, is this 12th headcount going to be a developer headcount or an SRE headcount? It means that if your service is more reliable, you need fewer SREs 
and you have more headcount for development, which means that you can roll forward faster. However, if your service is in a bad shape, we take developer headcount and we give it to SRE. In the end, you get 20 headcount and that's it. And again, we have a self-regulating system. It's in, it's in the interest of the developers to write stable and reliable systems because it means that they can move forward, they have larger teams. So that's one, one fix. Second fix, we hire only coders in SRE. We hire software engineers. Uh, why do we hi hire software engineers? Well, they can talk with the devs. They, they understand the devs. They, they can talk the same language. Actually, we look at code in the same way. We, we will be in a meeting looking at that code. Why did this code suddenly become 10 times slower? That's not good. Well, an SRE might take a look at the code together with a developer and say, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? We talk the same language. Um, they know what a computer can do. Usually the SREs are also very well known, uh, very well versed in um, operating systems and a little bit in tinkering with hardware. They, they know low level what a computer can do and also what it can't because assumptions about computers. Did you know, did you know that the speed of light inside a virtual machine is also limited? It is not infinite, even in a virtual machine. Things like that are known by, yeah, uh, SREs. Software engineers, they get bored. If you have to do the same thing time and time again to fix something, what does a software engineer do? Automate it. Automate it away. And what we say within SRE is we try to automate ourselves of a job, out of a job every 18 months. And then something new comes along and we start again automating ourselves out of a job. Um, so we code a lot. Second thing, third thing, we have a 50% cap on ops work. We try to have about 30% of ops work. And ops work means being on call, solving tickets, um, helping with rollouts, things like that. And we want to have that at about 30%, but not more. But the maximum is 50%. Yeah, and what happens if the system is in a bad state and we get over 50%? Guess what? We hand over the pager to the developers and they can fix whatever is more than 50%, which means that it slows down their development. It's in their interest to develop stable and reliable code. Again, a self-regulating system. Um, we want enough time for the SREs to do serious coding to do automation. For example, rollout automation. We will talk a little bit about that later on. Then another great incentive in making sure that the developers develop stable and reliable software is they are in the rotation as well. We don't take 100% of the ops work, we take 95%. The devs get 5% of the ops work. And the moment they get paged 3 a.m. because their service is unreliable, and the next day they get paged again, and the next day they get paged again, they will go to their teammate who developed that one feature and said, you make the paging stop. Or you can have it, the pager, I mean. Right? So, yes, we carry the pager and it's our job, but whenever they, they also get to share a little bit of the load. We s make sure that the developers see the product in production the way it performs, the way it runs. That way, they do not give us the complete responsibility, but they feel responsible as well and are interested in getting a reliable system. Nothing builds consensus like bug priorities, uh, in bug priorities like a few sleepless nights. If, if the devs get woken up three times in a row because this bug 
that they gave a very low priority for fixing, suddenly this priority goes up. Um, I don't know why. Um, however, it is very hard. Not all teams do this. Not all teams have their uh, developers in the rotation. Um, it requires a lot of talking from managers uh, or vice presidents or directors to have a team actually do that because if the devs can get away with it, they will try not to be in the rotation for obvious reasons. Um, we will fight to actually have them in the rotation. So, speaking of dev and uh, ops work, um, like I said, if there is excess uh, ops work, we will actually offload this uh, to the dev team, uh, which is a self-regulating system. Now, of course, they might choose not to pick that up if there is access work or tickets that are open. You know, a ticket is something like a sliver of paint is coming off my windowsill. The tickets might pile up. So what, what will happen then? Any idea? Well, here goes your reliability, and here's your SLA. So, boof, uh, they go below their SLA, and the moment that happens, suddenly we don't do any launches anymore, which is the one thing that devs really want. So the 5% thing is really important. It is important to keep them in the loop, to have them actually uh, feel the pain of unreliable uh, systems. Another thing that helps us here is Esri portability. What is Esri portability? Well, it is there on many levels. Suppose you have a dev team that has a very bad uh, habit, a ba very bad way of working. It means that the ops load is going to be high and the Esri's are not liking their job. And what do the Esri's do? They will say, you know what? I have been in this team for a year and a half, there is plenty of SRE teams within Google. I know there is open head. Oh, that team over there, they have open headcount. They have a very interesting project. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk with that manager and um, get a transfer to that other team. And before you know it, the SRE team dissolves. Um, <coughs> so there is portability. The idea is that SREs move from team to team. Um, it's also possible if the, um, the dev team is doing a really, really bad job and it is really impossible to keep things up that the SRE team says, you know what, here's the page you're back. We are no longer responsible for your team. We're going to some other project that is more interesting. It doesn't happen often that we give the page you're back, but the threat is real. And the, th the threat being there also makes the developers make reliable software that is more stable. Then, oh, finally, we have death, taxes, and outages. Did we say that we have an SLA that is below 100%? Did we say that we have an error budget? Does that mean that we actually allow outages? That we allow the system to be down? Yes. It's not something we like, but it is something we allow for to keep the system uh, moving forward. Um, we have two goals for every outage. Whenever an outage is there, it is to minimize impact, and it is to prevent that it ever happens again. And if you look at the total cost, it is the impact times the scope times how often it happens. And you can try to minimize all three of these. So how can we make sure that we get this goal? Well, first of all, we minimize the damage. We try to make the, sh the outage as short as possible. 
Now, first of all, we don't have a NOC, a NOC, a network uh, operation center where you have all these monitors, an enormous wall of monitors, and lots of eyeballs looking at all these monitors. Um, sorry, we don't do that. Uh, we have software for that. Whenever there is something that is bad, um, our monitoring systems will page the person who is on call, and that person will look, then look at graphs and try to find the cause. Then you mitigate. So for example, uh, you notice that there is um, there are a lot of errors that we send out because of some um, problem when we do a Google search with uh, images. Well, you know what we can do? We can not do the images for some time. At least we get search results back. Um, we want to have good diagnostic information, and we need to practice finding uh, bugs a lot. Practice, practice, practice. And Question, is that fun? Do you like the fire drills at home? We do them every week. Uh, it's called Wheel of Misfortune. Uh, it is one of the most popular SRE events. Uh, actually, it depends on what team you're in, um, if they will call it Wheel of Misfortune, or I'm in a team that uh, runs the monitoring system. It's called Monarch for monitoring architecture. Monarch is a butterfly. Our wheel of misfortune is called the killing jar. Um, I know that um, uh, the, the ads team have something called uh, the horrifics of poverty. Um, anyway, what is it? You have a number of outages that you think of. There is a dungeon master who thinks of an outage and says, OK, you get paged. This is what you see on your monitor. What do you do next? And you play, you do a role-playing game to try and solve that problem. It is, uh, it is awesome. We also try to prevent recurrence. Um, what does it mean? Well, you handle the event. You first you mitigate. Then you try to find the root cause. You write the postmortem and reset. Given this. It means that per on-call shift, you cannot have more than one or two serious outages because you have to mitigate, find the root cause, and write a postmortem. Because of this, you need a certain group size. And what we usually do is, we, for single-site SRE teams, we have eight people. And for dual sites, so for example, um, US East Coast and uh, Europe, We'll have two times six people, so you're on call once every six weeks, and you don't have to be on call during the night, because then the other side takes over. Now, a word about postmortems. Um, this is really, really, really important. Postmortems are that what you write when something bad happens. A postmortem has to be completely honest. Completely honest. You don't want to put something under the rug, because then something will ha that same thing will happen again. It is completely blameless. It is just an objective. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Where were we lucky? Where were we not so lucky? Um, and this is the list of bugs that we filed and that we will track to make sure that this will never, ever happen again. And if you do this, then it won't happen again. And then you have learned. However, if you don't have blameless postmortems, you will never get to the state that you actually repair and learn from your errors. We had a presentation two years ago where three people who caused the largest outages in Google came on the stage together with the senior vice presidents and explained what had gone wrong. And that was the time that we celebrated our postmortem culture. So in a summary, um, you have coders in your SRE team. You have an SLA. Given that SLA, you have an error budget. The SRE team is there to keep things running, but the software engineers are responsible as well. Um, you have at most one to two events per shift. You practice, practice, and practice. And most important, I think, blameless postmortem focusing on the technology. Now, all of this has actually been written down in this book. 
uh, by some uh, colleagues uh, and one chapter by myself. Um, it was a Amazon bestseller, actually, uh, which is awesome. Um, and now you can actually also read it online for free. So with that, there were also some um, resources on the Google website, www.google.com slash SRE. And perhaps we have time for, no more time for questions. OK, time for questions in the break. One question there. Um, I guess what I'm looking for is, uh, is a slide that says fix number seven, I think. Um, so here's the problem. You hire SREs as a developers. And I get that we do the same thing in Salesforce. Um, they have, uh, you said 50% operational work? Um, at most. At most. 30%. Okay, yeah, okay. Whatever that number is, uh, it's an operational work. Um, and uh, the problem is, at least uh, in our environment, is you can't predict that. It's, it's an interrupt-driven work because it's operational work. Uh, it can happen anytime. Um, so when I have a programmer, they need a, a lot of time to focus. They want to be you know, involved in programming. And then with, when this happens, uh, the interruption thing, do you have any ideas how to fix that, yeah. that problem? Um, operational work is done by the SRE who is on call that week, which means if you're on call every six weeks, um, you, you lose that week, but the idea is that the other weeks you spend on, uh, on project work. And of course, um, we, when you're on call, yes, you're the first point of contact, but if there's something you don't know how to handle, you can always ask one of your colleagues who said, can you look over my shoulder, please? And that's why it's not 16% or 15%. That's why it may get to 30%. Uh, but it's really the on-caller who does the interrupts, and all the other people are working on their projects. This makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Okay, well, thank you.